Um, our first speaker this morning uh, is making his second appearance at a Hillsdale College event. He's an expert on war and foreign policy, and we're delighted he could speak for us again. Mark Moyar is a visiting scholar at the Foreign Policy Initiative, the recipient of a PhD from Cambridge University. Dr. Moyar previously served as a professor at the US Marine Corps University and as a senior fellow at the Joint Special Operations University. Uh, in recent years, he has worked as a consultant for the Special Operations Joint Task Force Afghanistan, US Special Operations Command, and US Central Command. Uh, he's a frequent contributor to the Wall Street Journal, uh, and he's the author of several books. Uh, one is Triumph Forsaken, the Vietnam War, 1954 to 1965. And another is Strategic Failure, How President Obama's Drone Warfare, Defense Cuts, and Military Amateurism Have Imperiled America. Uh, Mark, tell us what you really think. <laughs> he had, uh, Mark had just published Strategic Failure last year when we invited him to speak, and he'll be drawing on themes uh, from that book this morning. His topic is American Foreign Policy, What is Wrong and How to Fix It. Please welcome Mark Moyer. I'm going to move these microphones downwards. Uh, if I had more time, I would talk about how uh, our speaker from last night, our friend from Milwaukee, and Mr. Casper possess what in the university is known as vertical privilege, and uh, how students should be required to attend sessions to to deconstruct that privilege. Um, so it's a pleasure, it's a pleasure and honor to be here at Hillsdale today. Um, and as of today, I've actually attended more Hillsdale events than events at my my own alma mater, which is at least part of, in part a matter of choice. Um, I do feel more at home in an institution that recites the Pledge of Allegiance before dinner than one that uh, greets students at dinner with what it calls placemats for social justice. Um, so thank you, Dr. Oren and uh, Doug Jeffrey, Tim Casper, Matt Bell, and the rest of the great Hillsdale team for including me in this great gathering here. The last time I set foot in Afghanistan was in the summer of 2013, which was during the drawdown of U.S. forces that President Obama had ordered over the objections of his senior military commanders. And the generals, like just about everyone else in the U.S. military, had believed that the Afghan security forces were not ready to continue the war without large numbers of American troops to provide combat advisors and air support. Um, President Obama dismissed that view, uh, at times going so far as to say that the large U.S. military footprint was counterproductive because it put a strain on Afghanistan. So during a month of traveling across Afghanistan's alluvial river valleys and snow-capped mountains, uh, I had the opportunity to speak with Afghan government officials, police chiefs, and military officers. Uh, sitting on uh, rugged carpets, I conversed with toothless Afghan village elders uh, who often surprised me with their detailed knowledge of the withdrawals of American military vehicles and equipment and American base closures. When I asked them about the impact of the American withdrawals, nearly all of the Afghans said that the American departure was going to spell disaster for Afghanistan. Now, the American withdrawals, as they explained, were going to open the door to the Taliban by weakening the Afghan security forces and by showing the Afghans that the United States was abandoning them. Uh, and even the, the bravest and, and most renowned commanders in the Afghan army and police acknowledged that this rapid American drawdown was going to put the government's existence in jeopardy. And then in the nearly, nearly uh, three years that have since passed, those Afghan fears have unfortunately been realized. Um, and having been deprived of American support, the Afghan security forces have sustained crippling losses and lost control over large areas of the country that have been purchased in years past at great cost in American and Afghan blood. And ta Taliban flags are now flying within three miles of Lashkar Gah, which is one of the most important cities in Afghanistan. Last month, the outgoing U.S. Commander, General John Campbell, recommended loosening restrictions on American air support and combat advising in, in order to halt the momentum of the insurgents. President Obama, uh, who 
as you may recall, once won his first presidential election by promising to ramp up what he called the good war in Afghanistan, uh, ignore General Campbell's recommendation. This downward spiral in Afghanistan is, I think, in, in a lot of respects, a microcosm of American foreign policy in the, in the age of Obama. And for Afghanistan, as for the rest of the world's countries, the pivotal year was 2011. And that was the year that President Obama cast off the politically driven pretenses of a robust foreign policy and began a broad military retreat. During 2011, Obama articulated a new strategy that called for bringing American troops home and downsizing the armed forces, which was a strategy design, motivated by a desire to downsize the military and cut defense spending in order to spare domestic programs from budget cuts. So in this spirit, Obama pulled American forces out of Iraq in late 2011, again over the objections of the generals. And this, as I go into a lot of depth in strategic failure, this really destroyed the sectarian accommodation in Iraq and paved the way for the rise of ISIS. The Obama administration vowed to pivot to Asia, but its budget cuts prevented the promised transfers of air and naval assets to the Pacific. As a result of that, America's military standing in the Far East sank, and that caused the, the region's smaller countries to bend to the will of the Chinese. Now, to compensate for this contraction of the military, Obama intensified surgical strikes against Islamic extremists through drones and special operations raids. Uh, the administration advocates of the war by surgical strike, of whom Vice President Biden was the loudest, uh, claimed that the strikes would keep the lid on terrorist organizations at a very low price. Now, we've seen over time that the drone strikes and special operations raids have killed hundreds of terrorists, but they haven't crippled terrorist organizations or prevented them from, taking, uh, from attacking the United States or deprived them of sanctuary. Uh, and on Obama's watch, Al-Qaeda and ISIS have gained sanctuaries in Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Libya, and Mali, giving them more square miles of sanctuary than they possessed on September 11, 2001. And continue a Democratic Party tradition that dates back to George McGovern's ill-fated candidacy in 1972. Obama has adhered to the principle that the United States does not need to assert itself militarily to maintain its credibility as a superpower. Uh, his unwillingness to deploy and employ military force has, uh, however, I think, inflicted severe damage to uh, America's credi credibility. Uh, and further undermining America's credibility is the, was the issuance of threats that Obama has failed to see through. And the most, most notorious of these empty threats was the so-called red line on Syria's chemical weapons. So when the Syrian government crossed that red line, Obama did not attempt to enforce it, but instead made the preposterous claim that he had not even set the red line, but rather it had been set by the international community and the U.S. Congress. Uh, and we now know that Obama's hesitation, dissembling, and inaction during this whole red line affair uh, caused great worry among our traditional allies from Japan and South Korea to Saudi Arabia and Israel leading them to the worry that the United States would not come to their aid in a time of crisis. And our adversaries capitalized on this loss of credibility to undertake new provocations. Russia seized the Crimea six months later without anything more than a feeble protest from the White House, despite the fact that the United States had a pledge dating back to the Clinton administration that we would protect Ukraine from external aggression. Uh, Iran's confidence in our weakness as a result of the red line convinced Iran's leaders to drive a hard bargain in the nuclear negotiations that culminated in the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action in 2015. Another characteristic of Obama's foreign policy that harks back to the age of McGovern is the, the downplaying of external threats. That during the 2012 election, you may remember, Obama mocked Mitt Romney for warning of the threat posed by Russia. In one of the presidential debates, Obama scoffed, the 1980s, they're now calling to ask for their foreign policy back because you know 
the Cold War has been over for 20 years. And Obama derided ISIS as the JV team shortly before ISIS swept across Syria and Iraq. And last month, he downplayed the threat of terrorism by remarking that more Americans die from falling in bathtubs than from terrorist attacks. Now, the 1980s, I would argue, are indeed back, but in a different sense than what Obama was talking about. We are now in the 1980 of the Obama presidency, with a president who's forced to combat threats that prior uh, inattention had permitted to metastasize, just as happened at the end of the Carter presidency. So Obama now finds himself scrambling to contain the damage wrought by his weak policies in Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, Libya, Eastern Europe, and South China Sea, among other places. Obama sent 5,000 troops back to Iraq to deal with ISIS, uh, and he's canceled his plans to withdraw all American forces from Afghanistan by the end of his presidency. Uh, he just ordered an armored brigade back into Europe to defend NATO allies from Russian aggression. Uh, these are half measures only. They're intended to avert complete ruin before the end of Obama's term, I think, rather than to pull the United States out of the deep holes into which we have been dug. And getting out of those holes will now, I think, be long and arduous, even if his successor acts more vigorously and astutely, which I think is, at this point is far from certain. As far as his latest instance of minimizing threats, you know, the, the so-called bathtub comment, I think the president is also on shaky ground. If you look, uh, Islamic extremists have killed much larger number of Westerners under the Obama administration than in the last seven years of the Bush administration. And that tally would be much higher were it not for the fortuitous failure of detonators in the underwear bomb plot and the Times Square plot. The allegation that America is overly concerned with terrorism also misses the point that the number of the fatalities is relatively low because of the massive expenditures that we have spent on combating terrorism, both in the United States and abroad. And there can, there can be no doubt that without these expenditures, the number of uh, Islamic extremist attacks would have been far higher. This administration, like uh, prior Democratic administrations, has been more eager to apply military force to humanitarian problems than to security problems. In Libya in 2011, as in much like in Somalia in 1993, the White House ventured to achieve humanitarian objectives by imposing a new political order through force. The United States and its NATO allies toppled the Gaddafi regime by supporting Libyan rebels and did so without the use of NATO ground forces, which led Secretary of State Hillary Clinton to trumpet it as a triumph of smart power. And for those who are unfamiliar with the self-congratulatory jargon of the political establishment. The term smart power refers to power that is primarily non-military in nature. But you know, as we know, things didn't turn out quite so well in Libya. Th that absence of U.S. and NATO ground forces allowed Islamic extremists to escape from Libya's jail, led to the killing of the U.S. ambassador at Benghazi and the breakdown of central governance in, in Libya. Another manifestation of smart power, the Obama administration used diplomatic clout to oust autocratic leaders in the name of promoting democracy. Uh, the results were similarly, similarly catastrophic. Obama forced out Egyptian dictator Hosni Mubarak only to have him replaced at the ballot box by Mohamed Morsi of the Muslim Brotherhood. And Morsi's power grabs and his repre repressive tactics precipitated a military coup which the Obama administration reluctantly had to accept. In the case of Yemen, Obama ousted Yemeni strongman um, Ali Abdullah Saleh, which uh, in turn allowed the Houthi militants to devour the fledgling democracy and overrun the country. In another similarity with its democratic forebears, the Obama administration has used development aid as an alternative to military power. In countries such as Yemen, Pakistan, and Mali, it sought to spend aid in areas that were under the influence of extremist groups in the belief that alleviating poverty and ignorance would erode the appeal of the extremists. Uh, this approach has failed repeatedly and at great cost to American taxpayers, largely because the aid groups were not actually able to or willing to get the protection of security forces. And so 
the extremists intimidated or killed the aid workers, destroyed their projects, and forced the aid agencies to withdraw. The administration's foreign assistance programs, I would argue, have suffered from a number of other conceptual errors. Uh, by focusing almost entirely on poverty, the, the administration has failed to address the problems of ineffectual and corrupt governance, which, in my view, are the root cause of the dysfunction we see in the third world. Uh, USAID, Agency for International Development, has reduced spending uh, for programs that are focused on leadership and governance and instead spent more on sectors of less lasting impact. The last and least forgivable problem of the nation's current foreign policy is the intrusion of politics into policy. Now, most presidents have at, at some time or another given in to the temptation to let considerations of personal popularity, or part partisan competition, domestic legislative ambitions, uh, influence their foreign policy, uh, but I would argue that Democratic presidents have yielded more often to this temptation, going back at least to Lyndon Johnson, and I think Barack Obama has yielded more than any of his fellow Democrats. So the Afghan escalation of 2009, the drawdowns in Afghanistan and Iraq, the firing of General Stanley McChrystal, the Benghazi de debacle are just a few of the examples we see in this presidency of politics taking precedence over the national interest. So what can be done to fix U.S. foreign policy? Well, to begin with, the United States needs to articulate and implement a coherent global strategy, which is something that it hasn't done under this administration. And if you pursue a coherent strategy, it will actually make possible an active foreign policy where we are taking the lead, rather than a reactive foreign policy of the, the type we have seen since 2009. Uh, by increasing our military power and in increasing its use, we can restore our credibility and, and our global, global leadership role. I think the next administration will have to increase the number of American ground troops in the Middle East, in the greater Middle East, in order to combat the spread of Islamic terrorism and sectarianism. And in, we'll also have to add troops to Eastern Europe to deter further Russian aggression. We'll need to put additional air and naval forces in the Pacific to discourage our allies in the region from kowtowing to the Chinese, and in the Western Hemisphere to impede the flow of illicit narcotics. Now, these commitments, together with the need to rejuvenate and maintain our armed forces, will require an increase in defense spending. I think ideally to at least 4% of GDP, which will reverse a downward trend that we've been on towards 3%. And that 4% number is actually quite low in historical terms and certainly will not break the National Bank, which is not true of the entitlement programs that have continued to grow uh, during President Obama's tenure. So building a critical mass of support for a larger and bolder national defense will I think require a Republican president who can bring together the political right as Ronald Reagan did in the 1980s. You know, the Iraq war opened fissures between neoconservatives, paleoconservatives, libertarians, and other factions on the political right. Many of those have yet to close. But rather than relitigating the invasion of Iraq, which some members of these groups continue to do, I think it would be more productive to focus on a on a foreign policy agenda that has broad appeal across the right. And it's not, in my view, an overly difficult task because there are numerous areas of agreement. I'd say most on the right recognize the virtues of maintaining a strong military. You know, conservatives are generally attuned to international threats and are suspicious enough of human nature to doubt that peace can be kept simply through diplomatic goodwill and United Nations resolutions. Most on the right also recognize that maintaining cred credibility is crucial for a superpower and that maintaining credibility requires the use of force on occasion. Now at present there is a small but, but vocal element of self-described paleoconservatives who argue that, that most foreign interventions are, are futile and wasteful and we should avoid them. Uh, and they purport to uphold the traditions of paleoconservative icons including the most esteemed of those icons, Edmund Burke and, and Russell Kirk. But I, I think this is a false reading of, of paleoconservatism. Um, the great paleoconservative 
thinkers recognize, in fact, the need to intervene abroad against threats that uh, jeopardized our national interest or civilization itself. During the French Revolution, Edmund Burke actually advocated foreign intervention to put down the revolutionaries whom he called a college of armed fanatics for the propagation of the principles of assassination, robbery, rebellion, fraud, faction, oppression, and impiety. Uh, during the 1960s, Russell Kirk thought the United States needed more rather than less intervention in Vietnam during the 1960s, recommending that the United States shift from its defensive strategy in South Vietnam to an offensive strategy against North Vietnam. Now, opposite from the isolationists on the spectrum of, of right-wing foreign policy are those who advocate military intervention as a remedy to nearly every threat. And they, Interventionist ardor has certainly been weakened by events in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, but it's not entirely disappeared. Um, and I think the extreme interventionist is, is also as problematic as is extreme isolationism. Both of them are flawed by a, a one-size-fits-all approach to situations that demand a prudent consideration of the circumstances. And so I think we need to, to rein in our overzealousness and interventionism by reminding ourselves of the histories of war, which, which show that the, the human and material costs of war often greatly exceed what was originally forecast and that the outcomes often fall short of expectations. I think a large number of Americans can be rallied around the idea that, that the death of a single American at the hands of a terrorist is an intolerable affront to the nation. I think most Americans understand what President Obama seems to miss, which is that getting blown up at the Boston Marathon or, or getting shot in Paris is altogether different from dying in a bathtub or a car crash. Uh, you know, Americans don't tolerate the murder of, of one of their citizens in a carjacking or a home invasion, and nor, do, nor do we try to minimize the significance of those events. And I think protecting our citizens is a matter of national honor, and it's also a matter of deterrence because our enemies are going to be less inclined to harm Americans if they see harsh retribution meted out to those who have committed an offense. Now, President Obama does understand at some level the importance of a single killing, and I say that based on the strong personal interest he's shown in cases where the individuals were, were killed under circumstances of relevance to his pet issues. And we heard, uh, for those who were here last night, we heard a good, some great commentary on this. But if you look at you know, the killing of Trayvon Martin by a uh, private citizen during a street scuffle, the shooting of Michael Brown by a police officer whom Brown had assaulted after committing a burglary, uh, elicited outrage from Obama. We heard no comparisons from Obama about bathtub fatalities versus those killed in, in, uh, by police officers, but rather a call for, for justice. You know, the president was willing to leave no stone unturned and no dollar unspent to investigate the suspects and implement preventive measures in the cases of men who, who in his words, uh, look like they could have been his sons. Now, the, the shooters in these incidents both were acquitted seems not to have changed the president's tendency to view gun-toting American citizens and American police officers as, as more worrisome than international terrorists. The Obama administration's preoccupation with non-military power has resulted in a lot of failures. There are a lot of things we can do, I think, with, with non-military power as well as military power. We can regain confidence of our allies with the diplomacy of a president who is at once more congenial and more firm in standing up for uh, our nation and for its allies. And I think rebuilding our military and our credibility will do great things for our diplomacy. Foreign assistance can be made much more effective than it currently is. Uh, and I recently published a book on this subject, uh, so I'll talk a, a little bit about this. Um, for one thing, I think in terms of foreign assistance, we need to shift from poverty alleviation to the cultivation of foreign leaders, as those leaders are the people who ultimately are going to uh, fix the problems of governance that leave the third world in, in a perpetual state of dependence on outside uh, support. But the behavior of those leaders depends heavily on, the, on their culture. But foreign donors as, as such can influence cultural values uh, in, in these countries when people are fairly young, in their teens or 20s. And when, when 
individuals are in their 40s or 50s, which is when they're actually holding positions of power, they are uh, largely immune to cultural influence. So our enduring foreign assistance requires a long-term approach as opposed to the, the current approach, which is focused on the short-term achievement of, of num numerical poverty reduction targets. So the most effective way to affect cultural change is to occupy a country for decades and force its people to accept new cultural norms. And that was the model that Normans used in England, and that's what we did in Germany and Japan after World War II. The United States seldom has an appetite for commitments of that size or duration, but it does have another means of affecting cultural change, and that is by the education of foreign elites, either at foreign universities that we support or at American universities. And the U.S. government actually used to do a lot of this. Uh, we funded a lot of higher education in the early Cold War, uh, but then pulled out of in the 1970s because of a rise in anti-elite sentiment among America's liberal intelligentsia. So I think it's time to go back to that model of the early Cold War, which was very important in transforming countries like South Korea and Taiwan, Chile and Colombia. And that will mean increasing our assistance to foreign universities in terms of funding, curriculum, and student organization. It also means increasing the number of civic-minded foreign youth whom we bring to the United States uh, for uh, higher education scholarships. Now, to, to reap the benefit of those scholarships, what we need to do is make sure those students are actually tasting, taking courses in Western civilization and American history. And as, as you know all too well, those subjects have been marginalized or removed at, at most American universities. The United States, I think, can and should continue to support democracy abroad, but in a different way from both the Bush and Obama administrations, for whom it has largely been counterproductive. Uh, history shows that, that liberal democracy does outperform autocracy in terms of promoting peace, stability, and economic development. But history also shows that a startup democracy has a high risk of turning into a tyranny oftentimes one that's more violent and repressive than the original regime. Democracy was made possible in ancient Greece and Rome and then in the modern West by cultural values that are specific to Western civilization. Western individualism and Western law facilitated restrictions on governmental power. Western pluralism kept individuals from taking up arms against democratic governments that they disliked. The Western sense of civic virtue let citizens to serve in the government without using their office to selfish ends. America's founding fathers believed that su the success of their democratic experiment depended on these cultural attributes, and, and I think they were right. Of the countries that have since tried liberal democracy, only those with conducive cultures have been able to succeed. So turning traditionally authoritarian countries into virtuous democracies, therefore, requires cultural change as well. And in the nations where the 50-year-olds are not imbued with cultural values that are consistent with democracy, setting the cultural conditions for democracy is likely to take several decades. And if we attempt to transform such countries into democracies more quickly, it's likely to end up as unhappily as it did in Libya, Egypt, and Yemen. Finally, a better foreign policy requires the excision of self-interested politics from foreign policy. Our founding fathers made clear the need for political leaders who set aside their private interests in the pursuit of the public interest. James Madison wrote in Federalist 57 that the aim of every political constitution is or ought to be first to obtain for rulers men who possessed most wisdom to discern and most virtue to pursue the common good of society, and in the next place to take the most effectual precautions for keeping them virtuous whilst they continue to hold their public trust. So it's thus incumbent of, uh, on those of you who are voting, whether in today's presidential primary here in New York or in future presidential contests, to gauge which candidate would be least likely as president to spend American dollars or endanger American troops for the benefit of their poll numbers. The American people, their elected representatives in Congress, and the media must remain vigilant and hold the president to account 
for such corruption no less than it would for the theft of funds from the public coffers. Thank you very much. We have time for some questions, so if you want to just raise your hand, then we'll come around. I'm Bill Gaffney, and recently, within the uh, last few days and about two months ago, uh, we had a ship that was buzzed by uh, several MIGs and uh, came very close. We could pick them up on, on radar on the ship uh, a couple of hundred miles out. Uh, Two months ago, approximately, about 16 sailors were captured uh, on a gunboat that much outperformed the gunboat that took them, and they were held ca uh, prisoners in Iran. How far up the chain of command do you think uh, the skipper of the ship and the, and the gunboats got their uh, instructions not to fire? Uh, that's a good question. Um, and I I do not know the answer. Um, that's a question. Those are questions a lot of people are asking. Um, I think the, both of those incidents bring us back again to this question of credibility. Uh, I don't think you would have seen Iran or Russia doing those sorts of things with the, with the President Reagan, but it's become so clear that, that this administration will do anything possible to avoid a conflict that, that they're willing to keep pushing and pushing, and we've seen that. Um, certainly with Putin's got a history of doing that, um, which is why you know, we've, we're finally seeing this, this movement of forces in Eastern Europe. The Baltic states continue to be an area of great grave concern uh, because we've given Putin every reason to believe that we are not going to go to war over the Baltic states, yet those are NATO member states, and so if they're invaded, either uh, we are in war with Russia or the NATO alliance falls apart. Um, but, but clearly, um, the, uh, the, the Iranian one is a particularly interesting issue because, as you mentioned, we have, uh, it, it appears that there was no need for them to surrender. And that also, you know, most people that I talk to in the Navy think that, um, that they should have put up armed resistance under those circumstances rather than simply surrender. But again, you know, exactly how that came to pass I think we still need to get to the bottom of that. Thanks. Mike's. I think there's a microphone back. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, sir. We'll bring the microphone up to you next Thursday. My name is sure. Alice Labrie, and I'm former U.S. Department of State Foreign Service, principally serving in the Middle East. I'd like your comments on two things. First of all, I am very wary about the deal with Cuba. And number two, um, I don't believe in treaties because I don't trust the other guy ever. So I'd like your comments on those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the deal with Cuba, you know, I think this is another example where, uh, I mean, we're seeing this president certainly becoming more and more concerned with his legacy. And I think he's willing to do symbolic things and even things that run contrary to our interests in order to have things that he can hold up as accomplishments. I think the Iran deal is a particularly bad example of that, where he caved in on a lot of things simply so he could portray himself as the one who achieved some kind of deal with Iran. And by the time it all falls apart, he's going to be out of office, and then someone else can take the blame for that. You know, the Cuba thing, um, you know, the idea that Relaxing, uh, 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 relaxing tensions with Cuba and allowing greater commerce is going to fix things. I don't think that's it's not particularly plausible. Um, the opportunities for our businesses to go in there are actually pretty small, owing to the, the state control of the economy. Uh, if you look at Vietnam, which is a country I know quite well, you, know, you heard the same things about well, we're going to Vietnam and trade with them and bring our ideas, and they're going to liberalize, and, and you know, 20 years of that still haven't borne fruit. So uh, I think, um, yeah, I think we're not going to get as much out of it, at least in the near term, as we thought. As far as treaties, um, the, uh, we do have a problem, and we have a number of problems with treaties. And, you know, treaties, you know, seldom hold up 
when there aren't either interests or force that are actually there underlying them to, to preserve them. Um, we also have a great problem in this country, I think, in terms of the turnover in political parties. Um, and, 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 you know, my own view is that the uh, countries generally have greater faith in our credibility when we've had strong defense foreign pol uh, presidents in power, which is since, you know, since Kennedy has basically met the Republicans. And so um, it's very hard to maintain lasting commitments of that sort. Um, we do, and we find that, you know, the Ukraine case is, is uh, an exam excellent example of the problems we've had. You know, we, in 1994, we convinced the Ukrainians to give up their nuclear weapons because we said we were going to protect them. And, uh, and this is also a good example. You know, this president's talked a lot about how great disarmament is. Well, if you look at the Ukrainians, they gave up their weapons, and what happened to them? They got invaded. So, um, and then you know, President Obama you know, found a way. I mean, it's very easy. It can be very easy to find ways out of all these treaty commitments, and he certainly did that in that case. So, um, so yes, I think we need to be skeptical of, of treaties that are simply based on a piece of paper. They have there have to be underlying interests and, and force in place that will actually ensure that those, um, those will, will take place. In the case of Iran, too, we're already seeing violations uh, of that treaty. Yes, thank you for your talk. I think you left one element out I'd like you to comment on. The underlying driving force that these particular people present one power, control, et cetera, the usual features, is religion. They're using the religion to achieve their ends. The religion, in my view, was set up as a religion of war and conquest. Uh, if we don't do something about a reformation, getting that to change, there are a few moderates, not many. Uh, all I see is containment from what you said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so th that's an excellent, excellent question. and. Uh, I have written about that in, in some other contexts. I do think, um, you know, there are certainly strains. You know, much of the Islamic world is opposed to uh, ISIS and Al Qaeda, much as we are. But we've done a poor job of actually uh, enlisting their help in a lot of cases. Um, that's part part of why I I, I think uh, it makes sense to support education. One of the things we see with a lot of extremists is they have a very caricatured view of um, the West. And if you look at their educational backgrounds, almost all of them are engineers or scientists. And, and there's been a fair amount written about this, but um, you know, those people tend to, for one thing, they look at things in very black and white terms, but also they have just not been uh, you know, exposed to uh, you know, a thoughtful description of what the West is about. And uh, this is, again, a problem with our exchange programs. You know, we bring people here, and we've seen a fair amount of extremists who've come over here. Again, most of them study science and math. And uh, if you go to most universities today, you don't have to take Western civilization or American history as you, you, know, as you once had to. And so certainly we can't change everybody that way, but, but we have to do a lot better job of explaining what we are. Because I think even, you know, a lot of Americans today don't really know what it is we really stand for, the principles that, that, that we are based upon. Um, I will say, you know, one thing that we don't consider enough about Islam, too, is that it does have much higher uh, barriers to new ideas than really any, any place else you go in the world. You know, that's partly why, if you look at East Asia, we've been able to uh, liberalize countries there much more quickly because you don't have a religion there that you know, is automatically hostile to to foreign ideas and foreign religions, and so it is a bigger challenge. Um, I do think you know we need to we do need to think about ways to you know, improve our relations with much of the Islamic world. Um, you know, I think you know, Europe has a much more difficult problem than we do because they have a much larger Islamic population there, and they're they're really wrestling with that issue, especially and they've also got you know much higher birth rates among the Muslim population. And uh, I think they do have, they really have to reconsider their um, immigration policies. I mean, they're, they're starting to think through that. But, um, you know, I think it, 
it, it uh, when a group becomes big enough in, in that context, it does become a threat. I mean, we, we are not in that position, but but we do need to do more. And I think this administration, if you look at, um, it, it's really alienated many of our our um, Islamic allies um, in a number in a number of different ways. So so that I think for the hopefully we can get an administration that will will be able to get back to this. This also gets into the question of democracy too, because we have um, a lot of the people who are have been our allies in the Muslim world are not Democrats, and we've thrown them out. Um, you know, people like Mubarak. And so I think we're, we need to recognize that we can't simply believe we're going to democratize this place and yet at the same time not destabilize it. So that's why I say we need to think of gradual um, change in these places and starting with the younger generation rather than trying to, to, uh, to change these people's minds overnight. Yes, Varsi, on the basis of your, just as a guess, on the basis of your research and contacts, do you deem the continuing failure of the um, foreign policy to be attributable mostly to uh, stupid incompetence or evil intent or uh, equal parts of both, approximately? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's an excellent question. That's, uh, um, and I've had a number of debates with, uh, my colleagues over those questions, and um, one thing I will say to preface this is that our views on this are, are going to evolve a bit over time. I mean, you, as someone who spent a lot of time on history, a lot of important information won't come out for decades later. But I think we have enough information to to have a rough sense of it. Um, you know, I see there's sort of three uh, three factors at work here. Well, maybe four. So you have the stupid incompetence is certainly one factor. Um, the question of political self-interest and doing things that are politically beneficial to the president is another. Um, the third you have is sort of uh, a naivete about um, how the world works and in thinking, um, you know, that if, for example, if we give people money, they will like us. And then the fourth is the more, um, you know, I guess uh, sinister view, Part, which is, um, you know, supporting sort of radical, you know, movements, and we do see, you know, evidence that this administration has an affinity for, for you know, left-wing dictators in a variety of places. So, I think it's, it's all of those. Um, it's changed over time. You know, the first couple years was really more politically focused. You know, you saw Obama increasing the number of troops in Afghanistan because and increasing the drone strikes because he wanted to kind of show he was tough. But from 2011, that that part of politics has receded, although we now see the part of just trying to make him pr pr provide some kind of legacy. Um, you know, the incompetence, I think, has been characteristic throughout, and part of that is, too, that this administration has consciously ignored what the military has had to say. Um, and then, you know, and the naivete and the sort of uh, far left promotion of revolution, there's a certain in intermixture there, but I think we've seen, seen both of those. So I think really all four of those factors are at work here. Thank you for your talk. I wonder if you could comment on um, why you think we should increase military spending, particularly with the fact that um, we spend a huge amount of money wastefully in the military as it is, and also historically, if you look back before World War I, for example, uh, military spending was very low. So I wonder if you could justify why we should increase military spending as opposed to make better policies, as you outlined uh, so well in your talk. Yeah, so that's a good question. In, in uh, strategic failure, I go into this a bit. And I've spent a fair amount of time working in the Department of Defense, and I'll be the first to tell you that there is waste in the military. Um, I think there has been, the only good thing that's come out of the big budget cuts is that there has been some pressure to cut out wasteful spending. But I also say it's remarkable how much wasteful spending manages to survive those sorts of cuts as well. Um, so uh, we certainly need to do more, you know, we can, there can always be more done to fix that. But, um, you know, we've cut to the point that we've, you know, we've had to cut the Army by, uh, you know, over 100,000 troops, we've cut the Marine Corps, the number of ships are going down, the number of aircraft, and we're also seeing 
readiness is going down. If you look in the news, there's a lot of uh, aircraft crashing because we don't have enough to keep them up. Um, you know, the smaller size of the force is also putting great strain on our manpower because we keep sending the same people back into conflict again and again. Um, you know, certainly we do spend more than other countries, but, but the reason I think we need to do that and why we need to spend more than we were, you know, pre-World War II and pre-World War I is that we are the only country that's really capable of, of preserving sort of global order and, and we are so dependent on international trade and commerce. Uh, and there's other reasons too. I think, um, you know, Americans, we'd like the ability to go to other countries, to see other countries. That's, I think, very important for Americans to do. It helps you appreciate your own culture. You know, we have missionaries that go around the world who we'd like to, to uh, protect. And so, you know, no other, no other country is capable of doing this. I mean, if, you know, Europeans can't even now maintain order in their backyard. Um, you know, Russia and India, or excuse me, China and India are rising powers, but they're not going to, uh, well, neither of them really aspire to be global leaders, and they're much more concerned just about their economic interests, and they're more focused on their own regions. Um, you know, certainly you can make argument, well, maybe it's time for the U.S. to pull back from this. Um, you know, that's kind of what's happened in Europe. The Europeans used to be very globally minded. Now they sit back, but they're dependent on, on us. And then when they see things like Paris or Brussels happen or these mass influx of immigrants, they're at a loss of what to do. So, um, as I said, I mean, 4% of GDP is actually pretty low in, in historical terms. Uh, we can certainly afford it. Um, you know, if you look at entitlement spending, it's gone from 12 to 14 percent under Obama, and we do, certainly I think we do need to think about our long-term debt, but that's, you know, unfortunately that's, you know, politicians on both sides of the aisle have been reluctant to, uh, to touch that, so it's, it's not an easy problem. Um, you know, we have, in the book I talk about, we go through cycles, a lot of times the United States decides after a war that it's going to cut the military because we're not going to fight another war again. And, and that's bit us badly several times. You know, after World War II, we slashed the military from 40-some percent of GDP to 3 percent. And then five years later, we were in the Korean War and we're ill-prepared. And a lot of people die because the military is not prepared. Um, we've had more far-sighted presidents who, you know, like Eisenhower, who was willing to maintain a military in time of peace. Uh, and I think you know, most of our wars we end up in are not wars of, of uh, our choosing. We didn't, Bush didn't want to fight a long war in Iraq or Afghanistan, but given our position in the world, I don't think we have a choice. And so, um, you know, I think it's, it's either we cut now and um, imperil the lives of those who are going to get put in, or we uh, spend a little bit more and we're better prepared. And by the way, also by spending more, I think we help deter adversaries because they pay a lot of attention. You know, the Iranians pay a lot of attention to what we're spending on defense. The Chinese do. And they, they uh, prey on weakness. You're absolutely correct about the downplay of uh, Western civilization in the universities. Also, along with that, though, is the inculcation of leftist ideas into the schools of journalism. And as a result, the Americans are not really being exposed to the proper ideas of the kind of foreign policy that you correctly advocate. The free press that we're supposed to have in my opinion, isn't that free. And this is a big problem. We even see it now in the trying to influence the presidential election. And so what you correctly say is exacerbated even further by the kind of information that the American public gets because the American public needs to be behind what you correctly state. Yeah, I would say um, yeah, journalism is almost as bad as academia in, in that regard. Um, you know, the one good point is that there are alternative outlets more than there used to be, because um, this problem has gone back, obviously, for a long time. There was actually a great 
documentary on Fox News a couple weeks ago on defense where they actually interviewed Gates and Panetta and Hagel, uh, went into a lot of detail about all the terrible things that have happened to our military. Uh, and you won't see that on any of the other uh, networks. So, you know, there are people seeing this, but again, you know, a lot of, for a lot of young people, they're not going to see the 10 p.m. Fox documentary. Um, they're going to learn a lot from their university class and, and certainly what's a lot of military history is gone from the academia what's left and a lot of the diplomatic history is certainly has a certain biases um, you know and then we've also got you know with the millennial generation there's also a question about where they're they're getting their information in general um, but yeah those are those are excellent points and I think one other point I add too is a lot of educating the people comes from the the Oval Office. I mean, the president better than anyone else can educate the American people. And this president has almost never talks about the wars we're fighting. He doesn't say much about foreign policy. And so that again is where we need a commander in chief who will actually you know, educate the American people on what they uh, ought to know about foreign policy. Uh, my question. Uh, Admiral James Ace Lyons said that Islam is a uh, political movement masquerading as a religion, and it uses its religious aspects to deflect abundant criticism that it's a totalitarian system. Now, when people try to point this out, people like uh, Pamela Geller, uh, they're pilloried as being Islamophobes. And the press is not going to pick this up. But I think it's critical that the American people realize that Islam is a totalitarian system. Uh, do you have any ideas how this could be accomplished? Thank you. Yes, well, there is, um, you know, I do think there are, I mean, there's a, within Islam, there is a, the more extreme versions are very, you know, overtly totalitarian. I think, um, there is a real problem in this country in terms of um, political correctness opposing sort of any criticism of Islam or any notion that Islam is associated with terrorism. And the, the White House has kind of encouraged this view. Uh, you know, if you think back to the Fort Hood shooting, um, uh, Hassan, the, the shooter, you know, a lot of people were concerned about his. Uh, his views, but they were also afraid that if they said something, they might be considered to be anti-Islamic. We also saw that in the San Bernardino case, where people didn't want to report um, suspicious things because they thought they would be accused of bigotry. And so that is a real problem. Um, you know, I do think we need to, uh, it's worth, again, we can educate ourselves better on Islam. I think um, there certainly are different competing parts um, there are certainly organizations in this country um, that are aligned with the more totalitarian strains. Um, I think we, again, it, it's worthwhile to, to try to differentiate and to uh, work with those. And there, there's certainly some who are, are willing to work with us um, on these issues. So, uh, but again, to your earlier point, I think we do need to avoid sort of this uh, jumping to conclusions that any criticism of Islam is, uh, is, is out of bounds. But, you know, we should also, one other thing I would just add is we need to be careful how we say it because it can also hurt us in foreign countries where we're trying to rely on um, these Islamic countries for help. If they see us going a little too overboard, it, it may be detrimental to our interests there. All right, uh, we have time for one more question. Hi. Uh, with your experience in the Middle East, do we really have any supporters in the Middle East considering the present situation with Saudi Arabia? Yes, well, it's, there's not a lot of uh, love for us anywhere. I mean, we've certainly um, thoroughly alienated most of our former allies, you know, the Saudis, the uh, Israelis, uh, and we still have common interests with them, but, um, you know, and there is a, uh, 
you know, a widespread perception, is somewhat justifiably, that, that we are kind of casting our lot with the Iranians. Now, the administration has denied that, but, it, but certainly some of the things we've done give that impression. Um, you know, again, part of this gets back to credibility, too. You know, we used to, you know, you can criticize, there were a lot of problems with the Iraq war, but when we invaded Iraq, um, every country in that region was afraid of us because they thought they might be next. And so they were, we had influence with them, and if we threatened something, they could. Now, um, our credibility is so low that the countries that used to like us don't. Um, you know, the President's co recent comments about Saudi Arabia have, uh, you know, further jeopardized you know, what we're doing there. I mean, the Gulf countries in general are, you know, feel like they've been sold out, especially with the Iran nuclear deal. Um, and, you know, I think the administration thinks the Iranians are going to eventually come around to be more friendly with us. I mean, it's conceivable, but it seems, you know, I think there's probably a lot of wishful thinking. If you go back to the 90s, the people were saying that then. The Iranians are more modern than the Sunnis, and they're going to start becoming more friendly to us. And so um, I think that whole region is just very is deeply troubling, and we've dug ourselves in a huge hole in Syria and Iraq. Um, it's going to be very hard for the next administration to turn things around. I do think probably we may need to put more troops in there. As right now, our presence uh, isn't big enough to restore our credibility. Um, but if we, you know, the United States is really the only country I think that ultimately can try to broker some kind of accommodation in this Sunni-Shiite civil war, which is spawning uh, insecurity and extremism and, uh, and other problems. There's no easy cure, I think, the next administration when it comes in. I mean, there's going to be probably more and more bad things happening between now and then. I think um, there is, I think our enemies are probably looking at the calendar and they're thinking they're going to try to get in as much as they can before the next president comes in. and. If you look in 1981, the end of Carter's term, the uh, Salvadoran rebels launched an offensive 10 days before Carter took, uh, left office because they thought that, uh, they said the fanatic Reagan might, might uh, crack down us, so we've got to win this war now, which fortunately they didn't. But, but uh, you know, if you look at all the circles Putin has run around us, I think things could be even worse in the Middle East by January of next year. Well, thank you very much for uh, your attendance.